vertical intervention. Now, any good student of the Bible will realize that this amazing book, the Bible, 66 smaller books that are contained in the large Bible, written over 1,600 years by 40 different authors in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, from three different continents, Asia, Africa, Europe. Yet the theme and the motif is one singular idea, that God is ready to intervene, if you'll just look up. That vertical intervention from him that meets us in our horizontal need. God and his love for you and his love for me wants to do that. Now, we're going to look at an individual, the Apostle Paul, and I guess I've given away the answer to the question here. Who in the Bible made this comment about himself? I'm a wretched man. Well, I already gave away the answer, so give me the It's not rhetorical anymore. Throw it out. Who said that in the Bible? The Apostle Paul. Here, this stellar man of God. He pens a third of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Yet he will attribute this adjective describing himself. Now, there's a big question mark. Was he doing it before he got saved or after he got saved? Therein lies the dilemma of Romans 7. We're going to unpack it, give practical application in your life, because God put this as a message more than a sermon on my heart. Here he says, I'm a wretched man. It's recorded in Romans 7. A wretched man. In the original language of the Greek New Testament, it basically means an individual who, is, who feels that they're pitiful, miserable, helpless, hopeless. Those would be matching definitions to this idea of wretched. I'm a wretched man, miserable, pitiful, in desperate need, helpless, hopeless. In that state, he looks up. God intervenes. The vertical intervention of the Lord. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, what was his condition that contributed to this conclusion about himself? Why did he make this statement, the great apostle Paul, I'm a wretched man? What was the condition of his situation, his circumstances, or most importantly, his soul, his state of being on the inside? What contributed to that? Well, that turns us then to this colossal struggle that's recorded in Romans chapter 7. Now, in Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul will say some really strange things. He'll say things like this, the very thing I'm supposed to do, I don't do. And the bad things that I know I'm not supposed to do, I end up doing them. I don't get it. I have a desire in my heart to be obedient. I understand the commandments and the law, yet there's a fight on the inside of me that gets the better of me, and I descend into a realm of succumbing to the temptations, to the vices that encircle my life. I'm battling, and I'm losing. I'm battling, and I'm losing. Now, I know I put it in the vernacular, in the colloquial, but that's basically a, maybe not a word-for-word, word, but a thought-for-thought thought translation of Romans 7. He articulates this desperate state of being so depraved, not just deprived, but depraved in his condition. So there are a lot of Bible scholars, teachers, commentators that will form this conclusion. It's the Apostle Paul in desperate need of salvation. The picture that's given to us in Romans 7 is the Apostle Paul saying, I'm not born again yet. My B.C. days before Christ, I haven't been regenerated. I haven't received Jesus to be my Savior and my Lord. Well, what say you, Pastor? I would say, yeah, that's the correct conclusion. This is the Apostle Paul expressing and articulating the reality that this is who I am before Christ. I'm not saved yet. And I'm expressing the condition of my soul. And that's why I form this conclusion, a oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to set me free from this body of death? Most, no, a good number of scholars, commentators, Bible preachers and teachers, many of the ancient 
church fathers that would be in the first, second, third century that were leaders, they're referred to as the ancient church fathers, align themselves with that conclusion. But there's another huge group of theologians, commentators, Bible scholars, teachers, preachers, and Augustine, the very famous church theologian in the fourth century, most of the reformers during the Reformation, that would be like Zwingli and Luther and Kelvin, that say, oh no, this is the Apostle Paul identifying his battle as a believer. He's expressing here that as a believer, he's wrestling with the sinful nature and the flesh. It's getting the better of him, and he, he realizes, I'm a wretched man. I desperately need help, not for salvation, but in this process of sanctification. Well, what say you, Pastor? I say, this is true, too. Now, you're being political. <laughs> you're being like a politician. How can you say yes and yes? Well, it's not an either or. It truly is an and and both. And when you read through the text and you consider when he uses things in the present tense and in the past tense, and he kind of wraps himself around it, he places it in the middle of his very theological epistle, you can't help but conclude, hey, he, he's not saved. Oh, yes, he is saved. He's expressing his need for salvation. No, he's expressing this process of sanctification in his life. So here it is. One interpretation, two applications. If you're here today, and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. I mean, he's on the outside. He's not on the inside. He's a philosophical thought maybe for you, a good teacher, a moralist. But he's never become your Savior, your Lord, the forgiver of your sins. He's not on the inside. He's on the outside. A meal that you can smell but you haven't eaten yet. Then this message is for you. To hear Jesus reaching to you when you reflect on the condition of your soul and the desperate place that you're in and you form the conclusion, wow, I'm a sinner, I can't save myself, I'm a wretched person and I need deliverance, I need salvation, I need the gift of eternal life, I need the gift of forgiveness. Hear what is said by the Apostle Paul in Romans 7. If you're here and you're a believer and you know that your heart is his, but you know there's areas and sections and territories of your heart that are in conflict. You're at war. There's a battle going on. There's certain temptations that get the better of you. You've succumbed to them. Maybe it's with jealousy or envy or arrogance or bigotry. Uh, maybe it's with greed or lust. But you, you keep losing a certain battle in your life. And, and you privately, maybe not publicly or in the context of the church, you would say, Privately, I feel like a wretched person. I, I follow the Lord. I blew up with such anger. I used profanity. I got involved in that situation, in this situation. I made that decision that so does not reflect good morals or ethics. What's the matter with me? You feel the battle and the tension and the struggle and the conflict internally. Then this message is for you. Because here then you could say, the Apostle Paul is so identifying with that reality, he gives a window into his soul as a means of inspiring you with hope and encouragement that you too can experience deliverance even as a believer. So wherever it lands, as we just kind of walk through and unpack this Romans 7, think of what God may be saying to you. You need to get born again and you need to get saved. Your condition, I'm a wretched individual, you need salvation. You need God's vertical intervention of salvation. Or maybe for you on this side, you need his vertical intervention of his delivering power to not just give you a will that's striving and struggling, but a will that's empowered by him that you can say like Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10, I am what I am by the grace of God. He is empowered it's not an issue of willpower. It's an issue of an empowered will by the grace and the presence of God in the midst of this struggle. And if you're not sure about this struggle, just read Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. The author of that epistle is writing to believers. And I know the vast majority here are believers. He's writing to them in Hebrews 12, 1. And this is what he says. He says, now listen, lay aside that weight that holds you down. 
Now, he, he kind of creates it in the context of interpreting it as kind of an amoral issue. It's not something right or wrong. It's just some weight, some distraction, something that's cluttering your life, that's just holding you down. He says, throw aside that weight that's hindering your race. But then he says, and lay aside the sin, harmatia, the specific sin that so easily besets you. That gets the better of you. Not the ones that you easily dismiss, easily resist and rebuke. They never pull you down. No, I mean the temptations that all of a sudden when they knock, uh, your hand goes to the door way too fast. And when the knock comes two or three times, you open the door. Lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily besets you. That gets the better of you. Knowing that reality, we can appeal to a simple truth that's given to us in this portion of Scripture. Let's look at it for a moment. Sin, as the Apostle Paul will say under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, taking opportunity by the commandment or the law produced in me all manner of evil desire. And then he refutes an idea that the law is if the law intrinsically or innately is is vile or wrong. So he says, look... Has then what is good, that is the law, the command of God, become death to me? Certainly not. You see, the law of God or the commandments of God, they reveal things. They become a floodlight. They expose our soul. They show what's going on in there in contrary to God's will. But they don't provide a solution or a remedy. They don't help. It's like an x-ray machine or an MRI. It identifies a disease or an infirmity or a sickness happening within your body, but it doesn't bring any solution. The physicians have to. The medicine has to. But there's nothing wrong with the x-ray machine. You also don't want to form the conclusion, oh, this is a diseased x-ray machine. It's a diseased MRI. No. There's no fault here to the law or to the command. The fault is to the battle with the sinful nature. And that's what he's expressing here. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. Can anyone identify? Don't raise your hand. But what I hate, oh boy, but what I hate that I do, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. Do you hear his dilemma? Again, some of you might say, well, that's Paul expressing the fact he isn't saved. Okay, got it. I agree with you. That's Paul expressing himself as a sanctified believer that's in the process of sanctification and and trying to get victory in an area. Yeah, I agree with you there too. They're both applicable. But where are you? That's when it becomes practical. Where are you? Is that struggle with the flesh What you feed will lead. If you feed your flesh, your flesh will dominate and lead. Now, there's all different ways of structuring out and understanding human personality, psyche. You read the writings of Sigmund Freud, and he'll define it as the id, the ego, and the superego. I just look at Holy Scripture, and it says, listen, you're dealing with the flesh, the sinful nature that's at enmity with God. It's here in Romans 7. It's also recorded in Galatians chapter 5. It says there's this battle that's going on. This fight that's going on. How do I win that fight? The Apostle Paul gives us a simple answer in a moment. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. This is the great Apostle Paul expressing his condition, giving us a window into his struggle. That is evil is present in me. That's the sinful nature. The one who wills to do good, for I delight... In the law of God. Now you can see why many commentators and theologians say, he's talking about his walk as a believer here. I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members. Warring. The bitterness, the unforgiveness, the anger, the jealousy, the arrogance, the lust, the greed. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin or the sinful nature. 
which is in my members. And then here's when he says it about himself. A wretched man that I am. Have you ever said that to yourself privately? When you've tried to really be really just almost like perfect or stellar in your walk with God, and then you just blow it. I mean, you just blow it. You fall. And when you're down there, you just say, wretched man. How? I don't get it. I expressed my faith. I prayed for the person I was in church. I, I did that. I said that. I processed through that decision in that way. Didn't reflect God at all. How did I get there? Wretched man, wretched woman that I am. It's that place when you realize your horizontal descent, the depravity, the weakness, the dominance of the sinful nature of the flesh. I know that may not seem real positive, but I'm, 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 I purpose always as your pastor to speak with reality. I, I, need, I need things that I can eat and drink and help me with my walk with God. I don't want to just be pumped up. I want to be filled up. And there's a reality, a battle, struggle, that horizontal low point. And maybe for you, it's because you don't know Christ as your Savior and your Lord. And there's a conviction. Conviction is a convincing that comes from a voice other than your own. Not the voice of society or the voice of self or the voice of Satan. It's the voice of the Holy Spirit. And his voice doesn't push you away, draws you to Christ. That's the voice of conviction, convincing you of your condition. Like a medical doctor saying, look, I know this isn't good news, but you really do have a serious blood disorder that needs to be addressed. We can address it. We have a remedy. But please don't suppress this or deny it. We want to help you. That's the voice of conviction of the great physician to us. So in that place, or maybe you're here as a believer, you're disappointed and a bit disillusioned with yourself. You wonder about even going to church anymore because it just doesn't seem to line up. You feel like you're disingenuous. There's not really an authenticity to your walk because of this struggle, this battle. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Remember, the wages of sin is death. Sin does nothing but destroy us. It's a dangerous poison. No matter how fancy the cup it might be in that comes to you, don't drink it. It'll kill you. Death does nothing but bring separation. Romans chapter 6 says, the wages of sin is death. The Greek word thanatos means it fragments you, it splits you, divides your personality, your intellect, your ability to interrelate with others and God. It just isolates you, alienates you. It's so destructive. And so that's his cry. Not what, but who will deliver me from this body of sin and death. Now, this is the moment when the Lord will turn a minus in your life and in my life into a plus. That minus, that negative place, that dark area that desperately needs his vertical intervention. He can do it if you look up and you'll ask him. I mean, you really genuinely ask him, God, would you turn this minus, this flaw in my life, would you, would you turn it into a plus? It really, in one sense, is as simple as God's vertical intervention. That, that negative, horizontal line, that dark, dark spot that you hide in the closet, all it takes is you looking up and saying, oh God, would you do that vertical strike in me and take this dark area, this negative, this minus, and make it into a plus a change. You're redemptive. You're restorative. I need your help. You know, uh, in the 1400s, there was a block of marble that they had gained from the mountains there in Tuscany, central region in, in Italy. They brought it into Florence, and there were two particular sculptors 
that worked on it. They were frustrated. They felt that this big, large, 16-foot high block of white marble right out of Tuscany was uh, flawed. And so one of the noted artists of the day by the name of Augustino worked on it for several years and just to no avail. He just felt that he could do nothing with that piece of marble. Later on after that, another sculptor, Antonio, worked on it, but he gave up on it. So you know what? That block of marble, big, huge block of marble that was flawed, stood in Florence for 40 years until a young man at 26 years old by the name of Michelangelo said, I'd like to bring my hammer and chisel to this flawed piece of marble. And so he did. Four years later, David came out. It's probably one of the most noteworthy pieces of marble that had been crafted by a genius Renaissance artisan like Michelangelo. And there it stands in Florence, viewed by millions. Now think of it. That's the hammer and the chisel of a genius and a great artist. He actually said that that's what he does. He's a sculptor. He never considered himself a painter, yet he paints the Sistine Chapel, which gives him even more notoriety. But here it is, Michelangelo. But I'm talking about the living God who will take the big block marble of your flawed life and if you'll give him the opportunity to pick up a hammer and a chisel and do that vertical blow into your life, he'll, he'll bring out a masterpiece if you'll let him. No, you won't get the glory. He will. Just stay there, yield yourself, and say, God, do your work in my life. Take this minus, this flawed marble heart of mine, chisel out a, a plus, intervene. See, that is the vertical strike. That's the vertical intervention of God. That's why Paul can make this simple solution. Oh, in the complexity of the struggle and the battle and the fight over here or over here, why does he give such a simple solution? Because his simple solution is simple, but it's profound and it's real and it works because he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. His focus is on him to intervene. All you have to do is lift the request. Ask him. You know the struggle that you're going through. You, you know the battle on the inside. You know the embarrassment. You, you seem like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You can't believe it. The antithesis, the opposite, polar opposite. And he's ready to resolve that. He's ready to do something about it. He put this on my heart, not to tease you, but to encourage you, to inspire you. Here's the prayer I'd like us to end with. It's a prayer that I consistently lift to the Lord. Some of you might say, well, that's kind of a lame prayer. It isn't very encouraging. It isn't very inspiring. You know, if you're a humanist, you'd say that. If you read the Humanist Manifesto 1, 2, and 3, they say, less than man's the measure of all things. He could pull it off on his own. He can do it. No, I form this conclusion. Jesus meant what he said in John chapter 15 and verse 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's not negative, that's reality. And so I'll start in my prayer, Lord, I can't. Maybe for you it's the issue of salvation. You can't save yourself. All your good works build a weak structure, a sloppy bridge, and it'll break the moment you try to get into heaven with it. You can't do it. I can't, I can't save myself. I can't do it. Maybe for you as a believer on this side, you contend with this struggle so consistently, so habitually, you even question your salvation. You need to say, Lord, I can't. I can't seem to get victory over this temper, this anger, this jealousy or bitterness. I can't, I can't get victory over this lust or this greed, this insatiable hunger for this. I can't. I'll lift my prayer to the Lord like that. You might not 
applaud my spirituality. I don't care. I'm going to be real with my God and say to him, I can't. I can't pull this one off. Lord. I've been walking with him for 42 years. Doesn't matter. All that accumulated time, it doesn't give me the additional strength. My reliance must be in him. Lord, I can't. But then I will say, based on Philippians 4.13, I know you can. When you walked on this earth and you draped yourself in humanity, you confronted every temptation I confront, but you came out victorious every time, every time. I know you can. And then I will say, help me to let you, Lord. See, that's the surrender moment for me. That's the moment as a believer I'm speaking now. Or if you don't know Christ, that's your surrender moment. That's your moment to say, I can't. You did it, Jesus, at Calvary, and I surrender to that reality. I give you my life. Over here in this process of sanctification for a multitude of believers that are here, you need to say that I can't. You can. Help me now. That's where his help comes in. He's the paracletos, the great helper. Help me to let you. That's Job 11, verse 13. The scripture says, lift your hands. It's an expression of surrender. It's a giving up. And the Lord says, I will intervene. I'll deliver you. See, when you lift your hands and surrender like that, the Lord will place in your hand a plan. He'll, he'll give you instruction. See, this is not a call to passivity. It's not just, okay, I give up, you do it all. No. When you do that. I have found so many times in my life, I say, God, I can't, you can't, help me to let you, and I lift my hands and surrender. As it says in Job eleven thirteen. 13, I do that. He places in my hand a plan, a strategy. He gives me insights on what I could do and things that I can implement, and then he gives me the strength and the empowerment to take it in. And then I'm real careful not to think that it was my willpower or Gary Zarlingo pulled it off. I'm the holy man. Oh, no. I would never be so foolish. Scripture says in James and in Peter and out of Proverbs, he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. I don't mean a false humility where you beat yourself up. I mean a genuine humility that says, God, I really can't do this, but you can, and I'm going to yield myself to you. Do it in my life. And you know, when that takes place, it's, it's more than a plus sign. It's the cross. That vertical intervention of Almighty God is the cross. I'm going to invite you to stand. Wherever you're at, however God is speaking right now to you, I believe he wants to stir you, to inspire you, to give you hope. As you look at the picture in Romans 7, if that's you and you need to receive Christ, would you pray this prayer with me? Pray this prayer sincerely with me. Jesus, you're on the outside, and I want you on the inside. I need you. I can't save myself. I invite you to come into my heart to be my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. I invite you to come into my heart and be the Lord and leader of my life. I receive you this day, Jesus, as my Savior and as my Lord, that I would be born again into your kingdom, even now, this moment. Now, if you prayed that prayer with your heart, there's a promise in John chapter 1, verse 12, that says, to as many as received him, inviting Jesus into your heart, receiving the gift of salvation and forgiveness and eternal life and the remission of your sins, it says that you become now his son, and his daughter. Now to you as a believer, if you're in that battle, in that struggle, and the very thing that you know you're supposed to do, you're not doing. Get real now. You're not doing it. You realize that you just don't have the resources in and of yourself. Your will is weak in that area, strong in a whole lot of other areas, but it's weak here. It's your Achilles heel. Would you say to the Lord, Lord, I can't, but you can. Help me now to let you. Oh, wretched man, oh, wretched woman that I am, 
Who's gonna deliver me from this battle, this struggle, this war? Jesus Christ, I welcome you. I welcome you. I welcome you. Let your vertical impact strike, chisel into my soul victory. I surrender to you. Now we're gonna sing this song just with your eyes closed. Forget about the person left and right. God's speaking to you. I know he is. I could feel him speaking and reaching to you through me. Just close your eyes and now, Lord, just say to him, Lord, I lift my hands as an act of saying, I give up, I surrender. That's not a sign of weakness. Ironically, it's a sign of your greatest place of strength. Your maturity is defined not by your independence, but by your dependence on God. That's biblical thinking. Just lift your hands right now. Just lift them. Maybe for some of you, you can just lift them low. That's all right. God sees your heart. Maybe some of you are so desperate, you need to lift them real high. As you lift them, let the promise given in Job eleven thirteen 13 be yours. As you lift your hands unto me, the Lord says, I'm going to bring deliverance. I'm going to bring my help, my intervention, the promise of Isaiah 41.10. I will help you. I will give you the victory. Oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's who will deliver you. Lifting your hands now to God. A position of surrender. Watch how he will his strength and grace into you. I'm going to pray a, a blessing, a benediction over you. And as people exit, I'm going to encourage you, if you need special prayer, maybe for you, it's not going to the lobby, it's coming up to the front. You'll be greeted by a leader that will love you and pray for you. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but through prayer, supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Some of you need someone to really agree with you in prayer for that which you're walking through. Or maybe you prayed earlier receiving Christ. We'd love for you to come forward and get some resources that'll help you grow and mature in your walk with God. So please avail yourself to those leaders that'll be here ready to pray for you. And now may the blessing of Almighty God be on your mind and on your heart. May a new hope and a new victory rise up within you. For greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You have victory in him. And may you walk in the strength of that. May that vertical intervention this day be yours. In Jesus' name, I pray this blessing. Would you say, I receive that? So let it be. God bless you. Give a hug to that person next to you, would you?